Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're doing part 48 of our Jurassic World Evolution 2 mod spotlights where we take a look at some of the wonderful mods and compare them to their real life fossil counterparts and today we've definitely got a very interesting assortment of animals we've got uh, uh, some remodels and some uh, new variants things like that so I'm quite excited to get stuck into this one so we're going to be starting off with a pterosaur this one is actually a skin based on a modern animal which I'm really excited to show you off, show off. So this is Jayolopterus, who came from, of course, the Feathered Pack, with uh, its skin based on a species of Nightjar, the Greater Eared Nightjar. So look at these wonderful little guys. Let's even get one of him in the light, because it'll be so much nicer to look at. Gotta be one in the light somewhere, so we can spot. Here we are, perfect. So this is J Halopterus with the Greater Nightjar patterning. Looks really, really nice. And you can see how the changes there. Originally, you can see the uh, this. You can see the original skin was also quite uh, inspired by Nightjars, uh, especially the Greater Nightjar with this kind of uh, plume thing going on here, the little crests. Or ears, you could say, quote unquote. So you can see the changes there, especially if you look at the original animal. Just look up Great Ed Nightjar. Uh, they've got like a light brown, then dark, and then they've got some lighter patterns on the bottom there. And then they also have the uh, uh, dark face along with the plumes going up there. So, what is the Great Eared Nightjar? So, this is a type of Nightjar. It's actually one of the larger night jars. It's about 41 centimeters in uh, length, uh, for, uh, with males on average getting about 131 grams. If you must get a little bit bigger, 151 grams. So it's the second heaviest night jar, but the longest night jar. So these guys are a type of night jar that it typically lives in kind of southwestern India and parts of Southeast Asia where these guys will live in they're quite crepuscular or nocturnal so they usually come out at night or during dawn at dusk and they'll come out and fly and uh, live in these kind of moist uh, rainforests and things like that tropical areas uh, or moist lowland tropical forests where they will fly around and uh, hunt small animals and the reason this is actually such an inspired pick is because their ecology would be quite similar because so most of the neurognathids have quite rounded face uh very similar to bats and things like that in that regard and i think this is quite an inspired skin choice and even you look under the wing you can see how it's been incorporated looks really really nice i really think this looks beautiful on this guy i'm not really uh, normally a big fan of patterns being just dropped and copied onto animals but i think how it's been done here it's obviously very much inspired by the great eared nightjar but it actually looks really really nice and looks fits the animal really well i'm definitely a big fan um really really cool and it gives me a good excuse to talk about an animal that i probably wouldn't normally have the opportunity to so that's pretty cool yeah really really awesome fits well in the jehalopterus definitely a big fan so the skin itself uh this is a cosmetic so you just pick it yourself uh you, know, you guys i assume you guys know how to use cosmetics uh, normally uh this is just called the night jar um, jehalopterus and this was done by game videos for life uh furlong and uh viral cyclops so kind of like the dream team in terms of skins so yeah really really awesome definitely a big fan look how beautiful they look i'm definitely awesome let's have a cheeky look at this one because it gives you a little bit of look at the body you can see the bright uh, dark face and the lighter colors and uh, yeah really really awesome definitely a big fan so next up we've got by um junibro uh, i believe you say that we have got a uh, new species we have got a winodon So Iwinodon is not actually quite a well-known dinosaur, but it does have uh, an interesting name, a little bit of history to it. So Iwinodon is a iguanodontian dinosaur related to iguanodon, things like that, and is known from a partial lower jaw that was found in the early Cretaceous age, so about like 100 to 10 to 100 million years ago, in the um, Durlston, uh, Bay, uh, Durlston Bay in Dorset in the UK. And the specimen was found in uh, 
the Pumbek limestone, which dates to about 143 million years ago. And this animal was first described by uh, Richard Owen, who in 1874 assigned uh, Iguanodon its type specimen and as, as a new species, um, Iguanodon holgi, with the specific name being na a naturalist, uh, the, sub uh, the species name honoring the naturalist A.J. Hogg, who originally collected the fossil in 1860. So this is really going deep into the history of paleontology. And the bones were damaged during its initial preparation, but were freed from the surrounding rock uh, by an acid bath between 1975 and 1977. So that really shows how long things can take in paleontology. Uh, David Norman and Paul Barrett uh, subsequently um, transferred this, uh, the species to Camptosaurus, but that was challenged. And in 2009, it was assigned its own genus, uh, Owenodon, which means Owen too. So it was named after Sir Richard Owen. So he had a very, he was pretty much like one of the first paleontologists, a very famous naturalist. He was one of the great opponents of Darwin, which is, uh, especially because he was very much more creationist, but very much uh, was important in the history of paleontology regardless. And it was originally in, um, interpreted as a, genus of Iguanodontia, and it's like more derived than something like Captosaurus, but less derived than like Ludosaurus, so kind of an earlyish, uh, like just after Camptosaurus, something looked like in the middle between there, so really, really interesting, and you can see there's wonderful, you can see it's based on the Dryosaurus, which is probably the best way to do it, it looks really, really nice, so Jibro did a really wonderful job, uh, we'll let them run off and do their thing. So next up, we've got another really interesting species, this one was done by, um, Darth Summit 19YT, uh, everyone's favorite, so we're going to release the Cosmoceratops. Here we are, this is our Cosmoceratops, a very, very interesting dinosaur that I'm very excited to talk about. So, let me look at you, because I like your pattern. So this is, we'll have a look now, we'll talk, talk about you, because you, you look nice. So this is Cosmoceratops. So, Cosmoceratops was a genus of Ceratopsian uh, that lived in North America between 76 and 75.9 million years ago, uh, during the late Cretaceous. So uh, this guy was, uh, specimens have been found in Utah from the Comparowitz Formation and the Grand Scare Case uh, National Monument, which is pretty cool, in 2006 and 2007. And initially, uh, adult skull and postcranial, which is actually quite rare for a ceratopsian, was found, along with partial subadults. And in 2010, the adult was made the holotype of this genus, and with the new genus and species name, Cosmoceratops, uh, Richard Sony. So the generic name, which means um, ornate uh, horned face, pretty much a pretty horned face, you could say. And the specific name or the species name on a Scott Richardson who found the specimen. And the finds were part of a spade of like ceratopsian discoveries uh, throughout the early 21st century, which is actually makes it quite important uh, for our understanding of dinosaurs. And it's actually considered quite significant because of its really, really beautiful uh, head crests. You can see going on the skull ornamentation. Really get good look at this guy here. So, um, as I mentioned, it was discovered into 2000s. So since 2000, there's been lots of people looking at that uh, Caparowitz formation. And then it was described in 2010. And also was named with other animals such as Euteroceratops and Vagoceratops as well. Uh, quite interesting. In terms of its description, these guys would have been about four and a half meters long, or about 15 feet long, and weighed about a little over a ton. And as a ceratopsid, uh, ceratopsid they would have been obviously uh, quadrupedal, walking around on all four feet and with quite heavy structures. Their body plan didn't deviate too much from other ceratopsians. They had the front legs that were kind of a little bit splayed. They had uh, the big frill and um, big beak, also round body with uh, uh, big back legs and all that and that shorter tail. So pretty uh, not that distinctive. But what really makes it different are these horns. As you can see here, it's got this really interesting, like, uh, shelf horn or table horn there with the bra uh, brow horns kind of going out of directions. And then you can see on the, 
on the frill here you can see what makes it almost like a like a emo fringe or it's got bangs you can see a lot of the scoots or epicostals i believe they're called on the frill coming down like that to really give it an interesting look and then the ones on the side kind of curve out and then go down the side so really gives its own distinct look especially for a cool animal like cosmoceratops um so yeah there's other smaller things that make it distinct but that also makes it very interesting as well in terms of its uh Relatedness, uh, these guys are believed to be an early chasmosaurine. So typically, ceratopsians are split into two. There's the centrosaurines, that includes Teracosaurus, Centrosaurus, and things like that. And then you have your chasmosaurines, that include uh, Chasmosaurus, Taurosaurus, and Triceratops. And where um, Cosmoceratops fits, it's kind of right early in the uh, chasmosaurine. So it's quite an early chasmosaurine related to any things like uh, Vagaceratops and things like that. And um, there has been some looking around that suggests there could be some subfamilies, things like that. But that's where it's generally considered in taxonomy at the moment. And in terms of paleobiology, uh, we know that the holotype was an adult. So we know it's pretty much was as big as it was going to get. And um, that is also, and it's also looking at the bone showed that they had radically um, oriented vascular canals that suggested rapid growth. So this helps some more evidence suggests that dinosaurs were warm-blooded, similar to modern birds or mammals, or the proper term would be endothermic, and actually did not show evidence of uh, lines of arrested growth like other types of ceratopsids, such as Centrosaurus, Pachyrhinosaurus, and Hitchosaurus. What suggests that these guys may have lived in a really tropical climate, like they would have had access to good food pretty much all through the year, and would have had no issue like sustaining themselves. Which is quite cool. And also found two coprolites from the Kaparowitz formation, which is believed that one of them may have been produced from either ceratopsians, hadrosaurs, or ankylosaurs that show um, fragments of angiosperm wood, or like the indicate this animal would have been eating a lot of woody brows. And there's also coprolites that contain traces of things like mollusk shell, um, arthropod cuticle, and lizard bones that suggest that may have been either ingested in a plant material or potentially could have been eaten to help support like gastrolus, things like that could be quite interesting. And it suggests that these guys would have been eating a lot of different things and um, be able to kind of uh, niche partition within the Caparitz formation and the environment they were living in. So that's quite cool. In terms of its function for the skull, obviously uh, ceratopsians are quite famous for having all sorts of different skull and frill orientations and people don't really know what they that was for. Um, the hypotheses often include things like for fighting off predators, though some species like Inosaurus, why would you have a curving horn to def uh, attack predators? Also, um, species recognition, which is kind of a meme, it, meme, it doesn't really matter. And or temperature control, some have been suggested these larger frills may have been able to help uh, regulate body temperature, which is something that could happen. But I think personally, the most likely uh, kind of application for it may be sexual selection. So able to display and uh, show that, hey, I'm a male and I'm ready to go kind of thing. Though, obviously, that has its own kind of caveats as well. So we can't tell male and females apart. Were they things that both males and females use, things like that? But yes, I would argue that's kind of the main, um, probably most likely, though you can argue some animals that do, like both uh, genders will have horns, some of them have horns that you can't tell them apart, so it can't be just for sexual selection, things like that. But obviously they could potentially use it for defense as well. It's kind of something that we'll, um, we'll just have to look through in time. There's arguments on all sides and it's an interesting debate, but I kind of think they would. Uh, be more sexual uh, selection because a lot of these are really weird structures and usually the only way these really weird structures evolve will be for um, to get ladies pretty much so um, if you look at peacocks it's, uh, things like that uh, a really good example of that I think and in terms of the formation they lived in, it's a well-studied formation. It's from the Kaparowitz, which is in Utah, and comes from about 76 to 75 million years ago. And this is back when the Western Interior Seaway was still quite big. It was receding a little bit, but it was uh, throughout the middle of America. So these guys would have lived in Laramidia, so on the uh, western side of America at the time. And this would have been quite a humid environment with lots of forests and swamps and things like that, and wetlands. Very similar to like Louisiana or Florida today, which is quite interesting. And this guy would have lived with all sorts of animals, such as Nesutoceratops, um, some Pachycephalosaurs, and Kylosaurs, like his Ancalophallus, um, Noosaurids, uh, Parasaurolophus, and Gryptosaurus, which are Hadrosaurs, 
uh, also some other Neonithiscians, also theropods they would live with, such as Chichophonius, which is a Tyrannosaurid, uh, Dromaeosaurs, uh, Talos, the Truodontid, and Ornithomimid, and lots of different birds. They also would have lived with large crocodilians, such as Dinosuchus and Brachychampsa, um, turtles such as Akados and Blastemis, lots of pterosaurs, lizards, small snakes, amphibians, uh, mammals and fishes, so a very interesting biodiverse habitat with the most common groups of vertebrates and hadrosaurs and ceratopsians in that formation that obviously shows bias. There's also been things found like eggs and in terms of plants there would have been large cypress trees and aquatic plants such as duckweed and things like that living in those areas, so that's really really cool. So yeah, now we know a lot about these guys. So a really, really cool animal. How can you not love Cosmoceratops? Uh, it's, I remember seeing a skull of these guys. Uh, there was a, like a traveling expedition in New Zealand, and I went to see them. And the, I love the skull of this. It's so, and such an interesting animal. Really big fan. So we're going to let them run off and do their own thing. So next up, uh, this next one is done by Hawk L, you know, 1215. One of our kind of favorite maystays on the channel because he, they make such wonderful, like, different uh, things. Especially, like, the feathered cosmetic packs and things like that. Really, really interesting. But we're going to have a look at a, another species of Stegosaurus. This is Stegosaurus ungulatus, uh, done by Hawk Owl. So let's have a little look at this guy. So here we are, he's our Stegosaurus, we'll have a look at you, because you're so pretty. Um, let's see if we can get one like slightly better in the light. Mm -hmm. yeah, we'll see. Now we'll, ha we'll have a look at you, because you're probably the best looking one. I like your colors on you. So let's just hide the UI. So this, there's three species of Stegosaurus typically considered, though you could probably lump that into two often. There's Stegosaurus stenops, which is quite famous for being Sophie, because Sophie is a Stegosaurus stenops. Which, and it means narrow-faced roof lizard, and this one is called the hoof roof, uh, hoof roof lizard, pretty much. So it's the Stegosaurus ungulatus ungulate, and hooves, things like that. And this one, this species, was originally described by Marsh in 1879 from remains of Como Bluff in Wyoming, and is often sometimes considered the same species as Stenops, but that's taxonomy being taxonomy, of course. And this guy was quite big, at about 7 meters, or about 23 feet long. It was the longest species within the genus of Stegosaurus. And there's a fragmentary uh, Stegosaurus in Portugal, found in the uh, Portugal, that may be uh, Stegosaurus ungulatus. So that is. The main way that uh, ungulatus can be distinguished from Stenops is by the presence of its quite much longer limbs, as you can see here. Uh, longer hind limbs and proportionally smaller but more pointed plates. You can see the states are a lot more pointier than Stenops uh, on here. Um, I believe the original Jurassic Park one is based on Stenops pretty much. I mean, it, yeah, Stenops. And um, they have these wide bases you can see and then they come up to these narrow tips. And some t and um, they can have several like small flat, uh, flat spikes before the tail or which is pretty interesting. So you can see they're quite flat bottom there, and then there's like taper out, things like that. So the spike like plates also appear to be paired, and due to the presence of at least one pair, they're identical but mirrored. They also have quite longer limbs and longer hind bones than other species. And the type specimen was actually discovered with eight spikes, though they were scattered from the original position. So it is possible that one individual may have had a deformity and had eight spikes, or Stenops may have had eight spikes. Or it could be there was another individual preserved with that individual. Uh, so it could have just been mixed up, you know, disarticulated, which is quite interesting. But there has been no additional specimens found with eight spikes. So it potentially could be a deformity, uh, which is quite would be quite interesting to see in the fossil record anyway. Or could more likely just like a mix up with other specimens or something like that, which is quite interesting. Specimens have been found in other quarries, and therefore a composite skeleton that's found in the American Museum of Natural History, which is referred to as Ungulatus, which only has the four spikes. And um, additional specimens have been recovered that include large plates and things like that. 
but yeah, you can see that's kind of a little bit different. If you guys know Sophie, Sophie is a Sten uh, Stenops, so she's got like a much longer neck and large broad uh, scales, I mean not scales, uh, plates at the back, so they're much larger and broad, but with uh, ungulatus, they're a little bit more uh, wide bases and then like spike up. Uh, it'd be cool to show you a comparison, but yeah, really, really cool. Nice to see variation within the species. You can see this is a uh, lot less longer and things like that. But yeah, really, really cool. Nice to see another species of Stegosaurus. Uh, I do like talking about variations within species and things like that. So um, yeah, all pretty much all found from the Morrison formation, though there is that Portuguese specimen. So yeah, really, really cool to get uh, uh, Ungulatus in the game. Another cool variation. So we'll let them run off and do their thing. So I believe we're done with this one. No, nope, we've got one more. So next up, this next one was done by Hans Wachtree. I believe you say that. We have got a returning favorite from, of course, everyone loves walking with dinosaurs. We have got Ornitholestes. So let's see if we can get a good look. Yeah, we'll have a look at you. You're, you. You guys are a nice one. Let's have a look at this red one, because red is my favorite color. So this is Ornitholestes, which means bird robber. These guys are a small theropod dinosaur, also known from the Morrison Formation, around the late Jurassic, around the Kimmeridgian. So that's about 154 million years ago. And it's from Western Laurasia, which is now North America. So to date, it's only known from a single specimen. So Ornitholestes is first theropod discovered in the 1900s. And the holotype was found in Wyoming that included a partial skeleton of a skull. They include numerous elements of the vertebral column and forelimbs and hind limbs and pelvis. And the original name was Ornitholestes, uh, which means bird robber. And the species name is um, Ornitholestes hermani, which honors Adam Hermann, who was the head preparator at the uh, museum, the American Museum of Natural History, and restored and mounted the specimen. So it's quite interesting. There's also an incomplete hand also described uh, or assigned to uh, Ornitholestes by Osborne. However, it's been noted this is a tentative. And also there was described a new small theropod, um, Tanicholestes, which was found a few hundred year, uh, yards from the bone cavern quarry. And since then, it's uh, seemed to be virtually identical to Tanicholestes rather than Ornitholestes. And so, and looking at the holotype, it seems that these guys may be Ornitholestes, things like that. A little bit of taxonomy thing, you know how that goes. So in terms of its description, uh, in his 1903 description, it was uh, wrote that the length along the uh, Ornithalestes along the skull and the vertebral column were restored at about 2.2 meters, so about seven feet long. And though that may have been inaccurate and more, more modern estimates these days kind of put it about two meters long or maybe a little bit over two meters long and maybe about 15 or so kilograms or 12 to 15 kilograms. But these guys were bipedal carnivores with a uh, small head, uh, smaller than most other predator dinosaurs, with a heavily built skull and uh, short, uh, robust lips and a short snout. And the orbits were also quite large, and there's been no indication of a bone or ring, that it's pretty likely. So pretty good at seeing stuff. The front teeth were also somewhat conical with reduced uh, serrations on it, which was uh, similar to those of other carnivorous dinosaurs or theropod dinosaurs. And there has been some talk, if you guys remember how it was depicted in um, Walking with Dinosaurs with that crest. How that came about, there was, in the original fossil, it's a broken bone near the uh, skull of the Nares. And um, some people had suggested, especially Gregory S. Paul in 1988, suggested that uh, Ornithalesis may have had a chicken-like comb or a nasal horn on there, but it's there's no evidence of that. Um, and it's actually been revised a little bit. It was a little fun speculation that got into walking with dinosaurs, but in reality, it most likely did not have a crest. It was just kind of how um, an interesting interpretation, things like that. And um, also has quite a relatively short neck with a S curve to it. And the tail would have been long and whipped like, almost like half the length of the body. And um, not all vertebrae have been preserved, but it estimated that all the least these had about 10 or 9 or 10 cervical vertebrae, 13 dorsal or back vertebrae, 4 sacral or hip vertebrae, and about 39 to 44 tail vertebrae. So that's quite interesting. And in terms of its forelimbs, uh, the forelimbs were relatively long and about two-thirds of the length of the hind limb, things like that. And these guys were often portrayed as kind of fast-running predators. Osborne also calculated these guys may have uh, been typical of theropods and be able to run around, things like that. 
And even some have suggested that Sky may have had a digit very similar to uh, Dunanicus and other kind of raptors. You know, they have the one big toe claw, but we really don't know. The poor preservation doesn't really uh, help in that hypothesis, so I guess they err on the side of caution. So when this guy was first found, Silurosauria was basically just a waste bucket where they put all small theropods into. But as we learn more about taxonomy, things like that, uh, it's kind of unfolded. So the most recent kind of interpretation of Ornithalestes is kind of a early-ish Tyrannosaurid or Tyranoraptora, which is kind of related to Tyrannosauria and then like kind of led into Compsognathids and then eventually into Ornithop um, Ornithomimids and then uh, Maniraptorans, so that includes... Manoraptors include like Trodontids, Dromaeosaurs, and birds. So it's kind of uh, early in that line, which is quite interesting. And people have been looking a little bit at the paleobiology. So people have been looking at the forelimbs. So these guys would have been able to move their forelimbs a bit. Uh, so these guys would have been, they wouldn't have been able to quite uh, straighten their arms as well, but they could bend their arbo, uh, elbows and stuff. And they actually use their arms to help grip prey. And in terms of their diet, uh, these guys have uh, interpreted teeth. These guys would have um, been eating birds, potentially. That's kind of how they were originally interpreted as. So they would have been eating like small birds and things. But uh, most recent authors suggest that these guys would have eaten pretty much anything small that they could eat. Like small mammals, lizards, frogs, salamanders, orangocephalians, so ancestors of the modern tuatara, and potentially even hatchling dinosaurs, as was depicted in... Um, walking with dinosaurs so they would have had pretty much like almost like a jackal or like honey badger type beat to them maybe something small in that mid-level ecosystem just feeding on small animals and there has been suggested that these guys would have been partitioning so it suggested that these guys with their big eyes may be nocturnal but um it's really hard to say that but um yeah, and there's also interpretation suggests that these guys might have had feathers. And we haven't typically haven't found feathers in all of the lefties yet. We only have the one specimen. But considering its relatives, it's very likely that it had um, uh, a coat of feathers on them, uh, considering it's basically related to between Tyrannosaurs and um, all the other feathered dinosaurs like Manoraptorans and uh, Silurosaurs and things like that. So it's very weird if it didn't have feathers. But yeah, really, really likely that it could have feathers. But another really cool animal that we get to talk about. Super cool. So we can let them run off and do their thing. So next up, we're moving on to the next animals. Next up, we've got another cool one. This one was done by Master Dude to return it again. We have got Eokarkara. Where's, oh, there it is. Missed out. I couldn't see my uh, cursor for a bit, but we can have a look at you. You're kind of in a good position. I like this one. So we have got Eokakara, which means Dawn Shark. Uh, these guys were a genus of Kakarodontosaurid theropod, so related to animals such as like Kakarodontosaurus and uh, Giganotosaurus and Acrocanthosaurus, those kind of animals. And it's from the early Cretaceous El Hartz formation and lived in the Sahara about 112 million years ago in what would today be Niger. It was discovered in 2000 on an expedition led by the University of Chicago paleontologist Paul Sereno. And the type and only species is Eokara um, dinops, with uh, its teeth quite similar to that of uh, other Kikarodontosaurids, with um, kind of sharp blade-like teeth that we use for ripping apart meat and uh, live prey, things like that. So very similar to other Kikarodontosaurids. And um, it's really only known from a parts of the maxilla and uh, orbits, so it's not really well known. And... Um, the bones on the brow are swollen and have a massive ba um, brand of bone, which gives it quite a menacing glance, which is quite interesting, which led to the scientific name or specific name, Dinops, which means fierce eye. And this guy wasn't too big. It would have been quite uh, like a mid-size, about six to eight meters. So it's still a decent sized animal, but just not like up there with Kikarodontosaurus and some of its relatives. And it lived in a very interesting formation. It lived with animals such as Critops uh, pilaris and Suchomimus. Also lived with animals such as Nigosaurus and Aranosaurus and Ludosaurus and Nigosaurus, Nigensis. So a very interesting assortment of animals living in that formation would have lived in what was now Niger. So yeah, really, really cool. Master Dute did a wonderful job with this one. 
uh, it's like a mix between Cacarodontosaurus and um, uh, Acrocanthosaurus. It's a very interesting one because it's really only known from some bits of maxilla and a bit of the brow ridge there, so you can really go wild. So I like this interpretation because it's kind of mixing uh, Cacarodontosaurus and um, Acrocanthosaurus. So yeah, really, really cool. So we can then run off and do their thing. Master Dude always doing a wonderful job. Next up, we've got by uh, Hans uh, Wachtree again. We have got Dusplidosaurus. So let's have a look at you, wonderful guys. I'm definitely a big fan of Dusplidosaurus. Let's have a look at you. Let's see if we can get you in there. Oh, I think you look better in that posture. There we are. So this is Displetosaurus. So Displetosaurus, which means frightful lizard. These guys are a genus of Tyrannosaur that lived in Laramidia between 77 and 75 million years ago. And they typically considered of three species with uh, Detaurus, De Wilsoni, and recently um, De Hornori, which was only found in Montana, with a potential four spe fourth species. But... um. We'll talk about the type specimen is a partial skeleton that includes a forelimb, vertebrae, parts like that. It was discovered in 1921 in uh, Alberta and was thought to be a new species of Gorgosaurus, but then it was uh, not until 1970 until it was named Despedosaurus, which means frightful lizard. And um, they also suggested that specimens, so it's got quite a few, a bit of history in terms of taxonomy. And over the years, there's been many species assigned to it. There's kind of... De um, the Taurus, and then there's the uh, Wilsoni, uh, which from 2022 as well, and Thanalestes and Decatorum, which also considered a species of um, Despedosaurus. So a lot of few, uh, quite a few species in there. Um, in terms of description, these guys, I've talked about Despedosaurus before, so I'll give Kyle a quick rundown. Uh, they're not the largest tyrannosaurs. They've got about 8.5 to 9 meters long, so kind of a mid-sized theropod in that regard, but still pretty big. They had a hip height of about 2.2 meters or about 7 feet and a body mass about 2 to 3 tons. And very similar to relatives like such as Tyrannosaurus. This is an early Tyrannosaur after all. Um, these guys would have had large skulls, got to about a meter long or about 3 feet and was quite heavily and bulky. Unlike its relatives, things like Albertosaurus, these guys were a little bit more bulkier, more in line with things like Tyrannosaurus that would come later, with large um, jaws able to crush things. So very well adapted for that. And um, very similar body plan to other Tyrannosaurus. You can see you've got the S-shaped neck, the two-fingered hand, things like that. So pretty cool. And um, there has been some debate. This is kind of the lip debate is something that's being talked about a lot. But the Spedosaurus has kind of been an animal uh, within that debate because there seems to be osteological correlates according to um, the, the, the paleontologist that described it. I'm not going to name names, but um, they found non avian theropods. And um, they would have had... Is, people talk about where their lips protect the enamel, things like that. It's a very interesting debate. But um, due to this feature, which has had it, which is... Um, the de degree of wear on the teeth and suggest that just bloody Soros may have had um, like a more crocodilian like condition but the wear on this more recent study in 2023 suggests that the wear on the teeth would have been more consistent with having lips very similar to like monitor lizards and uh, lizards today which is quite interesting in terms of its relatedness to other tyrannosaurs obviously these guys are theropod it is more closely related on the line it's tyrannosaurine so it's moving down into animals such as um the lythronax is re related to this and moving into things like jing tyrannus and tarbosaurus and uh, eventually tyrannosaurus kind of that line there so quite interesting and in terms of its senses these guys have had very uh well um Good senses of touch potentially because the integumentary sensory organs so they would have had large flat scales on their face that may have actually protected the snout during combat things like that and be able to detect temperature or potentially migrate a uh, good sense of touch on their face there very similar to modern crocodilians potentially and there is actually some evidence of social behavior there's been uh, large adults and small juveniles found together there's also been bite marks that have healed over things like that uh, that suggests that these guys may have either been potentially pack hunters or potentially would have been uh, good parents 
or even they would have just uh, been more similar to Komodo dragons and kind of just like mob carcasses. But the idea of uh, pack hunting or social tyrannosaurs, considering how prevalent uh, multi even like Tyrannosaurus and in Tarbosaurus and Albertosaurus we have, and even in non Tyrannosaurus such as like Mapusaurus, which is found in multiple age like formations, that does suggest that these larger animals or larger theropods may have had some sort of social life, even if they weren't hunting together, they may have like um, stayed together with babies, things like that, and moved in some sort of group. So that I think that really shows how interesting that is, and people think, oh, they would have just been big lumbering uh, solitary animals, but they actually may have had quite complex social lives. So that's quite interesting. And in terms of their life history, uh, these guys would have uh, grown very similar to uh, other animals like Tyrannosaurus, which we have a pretty good idea of how they grew. So kind of what happens is these guys would have um, spent a long time of juveniles, and then in about four years of age they would have had, or even like ten years of age, they would have started to have a big growth spurt, and um, they would have grown up to like 180 kilograms per year, um, and then they reach a mass at about two tons as adults. And um, Tyrannosaurus basically turned that to 11 that allowed them to grow from basically 13 there would have been two or three tons up to like six or seven tons so that's quite interesting and in terms of its paleoecology these guys are found from the middle to late companion about 70 75 million years ago and would have lived along like Montana and things like that the West Interior Seaway was a thing then and they would have lived up into Canada as well and they would have lived in last uh, large floodplains things like that with large rivers things like that and um, that kind of area and we have quite a good uh, fossil record from a lot of the formations these guys are found in so places like the two medicine or judith rivers they would have lived with all sorts of fish and sharks and gar and all sorts of dinosaurs as well crocodilians turtles skinks monitors alligator lizards and many amphibians and reptiles things like that in lots of especially in the old man formation they would have lived with um Brachylophosaurus and Ceratopsians such as Albertoceratops and Canorosaurus, also things like Ankylosaurs, Troodontids, Tromaeosaurs, Therizinosaurus, Pachycephalosaurs, pretty much all of that. And they may have coexisted in the late companion with Gorgosaurus and suggest that they, these guys may have had different ecological niches. So she says that uh, because Gorgosaurus is more likely built, more similar to things like Albertosaurus, they may have been like hunting. Uh, more lean things so such as like uh, hadrosaurs and things like that and then the splitosaurus may have been being a little bit bigger and stockier would have specialized more into eating ceratopsians and ankylosaurs so kind of more what t-rex was doing later potentially so that's quite interesting so um yeah that's the splitosaurus and i think Han Spock Tree did a great job with this one, really nice mod. I really like the colors on this one. It's a little bit bright, but I think the pattern looks really interesting. Uh, I'm sure we'll get some more. Dis the Speedosaurus is quite a popular dinosaur, so we've got plenty of Speedosaurus mods. So really, it's all to your tastes. And I like to see, I like to see people making what they want to make, really. So yeah, really, really cool. So next up, we've got another one from Master Dude. Uh, we have got an animal that I think is sorely missing from the base game. We have got Torvosaurus. There's a big guy, Torvosaurus. How can you not love this guy? I love Torvosaurus. So Torvosaurus is a genus of Megalosaur theropod. So it's related to animals like uh, Megalosaurus and eventually things like Spinosaurus. Uh, these guys come from the middle to late Jurassic period from about 165 to 148 million years ago. And is found in a, quite a wide range. They're found in Portugal, uh, Colorado, Germany, potentially Tanzania, Uruguay. And even England and Spain, so quite a wide range. Um, so it was first discovered in um, 1899 by um, Elmo Riggs in Wyoming, and uh, was, the material consists of like a left foot and things like that. But there have been more remains found of animals, such like in the Tinaguru Formation in 1920, and then some found in Uruguay, and kind of showed that these guys, because this was just after Pangaea was splitting up, this shows that these guys had quite a wide range. And um, yeah, in terms of its description, there's two species. There's kind of Tanneri, which is the American one, and Gurnii, which is named after James Gurney, who's quite a famous paleo artist. He did Dinotopia, was found in Europe. Um, so these guys were quite large. Even Tanneri was like uh, 
Tigurnii was a bit bigger, so these guys got about 10 to 11 metres long, or about 33 to 36 feet long, and about 4 to 5 tonnes uh, for the Portuguese species that made Tigurnii among the largest land carnivores in the Jurassic. And there have been claims of, um, as we'll get to with Marco Rex, because there isn't a Marco Rex, there have been claims of animals getting up to like 12 metres and 4 tonnes based on a Marco Rex and Brontoraptor. However, these claims are most likely erroneous, and it suggests that the adult size for Titanorai, or the American species of Tolvasaurus is about 9 meters and about 2 tons, which is quite interesting. So there's not too much uh, other than where they live that separates them apart. There's also like differences within the teeth. So there's num there's a difference between, like Tanurai has 11 teeth in the upper jaw, but Tanurai has less. Uh, and there's also some differences, some minor differences. In terms of who it's related to, these guys are a Megalosaur, which are basal position to Spinosaurus. So these guys kind of Megalosaur, these guys are more related to things like Eustriptospondylus and then Megalosaurus and things like that. And um, in terms of paleobiology, we have quite a bit about these guys. We have eggs that are actually attributed to Torvosaurus, which is quite interesting, found in Loharina formation. And it's quite significant because these are the most primitive dinosaur embryos known. They're also the, from the most basal theropod, with Megalosaurus are quite basal on the tree. And these guys also have a new eggshell morphology to the osteogeology of the particular group of theropod dinosaurs. That's quite interesting. And these eggs were sadly abandoned due to unknown circumstances. So we don't know if Torvosaurus were great parents. That is very possible, though. Even crocodiles today are great parents. So it's very possible. Um, all documented Torvosaurus specimens are from similar size, likely adult size individuals. And the lack of immature individuals may be explained by many different factors, potentially um, the bias within the Morrison formation for preserving larger things. Potentially there would be more adults in the habitat than um, the juveniles, or potentially because babies were so much smaller, they would have a different ecological niche and just didn't hang around areas where they're more likely to be preserved compared to the adults, things like that. And they most likely had type B1 population survivorship that was found in other dinosaurs. So mortality increasing after sexual maturity was achieved, and it led to an abundance of mature individuals in the fossil record. And uh, the final possibility is that immature Torvosaurus may have been um, misidentified, of course, which is also very likely as well because they have different proportions. So as I mentioned, these guys had quite a wide range. Uh, the type specimen was found in the bushy basin member in the Morrison Formation in Colorado. But we know what animals they lived with. In America, they would have lived in the Morrison Formation and lived with very famous animals such as Brachiosaurus, Apatosaurus, Diplodocus, uh, Camarasaurus, Camptosaurus, and Dryosaurus, um, Allosaurus, or the Ornithalistes that we just mentioned, Stoxosaurus, Ceratosaurus, and animals like that. And would have lived in areas with lots of uh, ferns, cycads, horsetails, conifers, and lived with all sorts of small animals such as snails, frogs, salamanders, rayfin fishes, bivalves. Uh, amphibians, turtles, sphenodonts, so relative to Atara, um, a crocodilomorphs, and many other small early mammals, and also pterosaurs as well, so quite an interesting habitat. In, uh, in Europe, it would have been quite similar. Uh, they would have been uh, closely uh, uh, lived with uh, Wernovator, which is a close relative, and lived with animals that were quite similar to the ones from America, so things such as Camptosaurus, or Lohrinosaurus, which was another theropod, Lusotitan, which is pretty much the uh, European Brachiosaurus, uh, Diherina and Lohrinosaurus, which is pretty much the versions of um, Diplodocus and Barosaurus, which has lived in uh, the States. Also, Draconiris and Meragaya were both stegosaurs and lived in uh, Europe, equivalent of stegosaurus in um, the, the Americas, and also some Ankylosaurs as well, like Dracopelta, which would have been equivalent to Gargoylosaurus and Moropelta in the Americas. And in um, Africa, these guys would have been known from Tendaguru formation, lived with animals such as Decreosaurus, Giraffa Titan, um, Astrolodocus, um, the Archbishop, which is a really large Brachiosaurid, Elaphosaurus, uh, Ceratosaurus, Allosaurus, Cantrosaurus, so animals like that, and very similar like Ramparinchids, Astarchids, very interesting assortment of animals there, sharks, less amphibians. So very similar species in these, like the different species in general in these environments, but very similar ecology, so it didn't look too different, because this was just after Pangaea was splitting apart. And in South America, there's been found with animals that have been referred to Ceratosaurus and some crocodilians and some unnamed animals. It's not quite as well known from South America, which is in Uruguay. And 
As I mentioned, these guys would have been living with quite an interesting assortment of large carnivores. They would live with Allosaurus, Ceratosaurus, potentially Saurophaganax in the United States, um, Allosaurus, Ceratosaurus, and Lohorinosaurus in Portugal, and potentially Vespirosaurus, which may be an early Kakarotosaurid, and maybe Ceratosaurus in Uruguay, and uh, Vespirosaurus in Tanzania. So these all species would have had potentially different niches, and there have been suggested that these guys, like Torvosaurus and Stratosaurus, may have been more around more, uh, waterways, and then the other ones may have preferred floodplains, but we don't really know what type of divisions they were, but this seems to be interesting. You could argue that potentially because Torvosaurus is a bit more bulkier, they may have been going after bulkier prey, maybe like um, Ankylosaurs and Stegosaurs, and you could argue Allosaurus going more after sauropods or something like that. We don't really exactly know the petitioning, but that's very possible. Or most likely they were they had a seafood uh, diet, so they see anything that looks like food, they'll eat it. But yeah, very interesting to see the different partitioning within the different ecosystems, very similar to modern ecosystems. And there have been bite, fox, bite marks on Allosaurus and Myrapalta remains, such as that these guys would have been fed on by um, Allosaurus. Uh, Ceratosaurus probably potentially would have been eating uh, some smaller animals as well. And there's another separate large taxon, which is tor likely Torvosaurus or Sorophaganax. Uh, both of which are not known from this quarry, so it's just that there would have been quite a bit of diversity, especially on eating things like Myropalta, which is a small spiky animal, very hard to eat. But yeah, this is Torvosaurus itself, we're going to talk a little bit next. This is another cosmetic that you can get with, you know how to do your cosmetics, you just go in, uh, you know, select your species, and this is another cosmetic within the Torvosaurus. We've got Umaka Rex, which we're going to talk about, very, very interesting animal. So this is Umaka Rex, a very interesting animal that we're going to talk about. Um, this was discovered in 1992. There was a large theropod found in the Como Bluff of Wyoming, which considers it has a bit of a shoulder girdle, the skull, um, the pelvis and rib elements, and it was named by Robert T. Barker as the Umaka Rex. And this guy was quite large. It's been estimated these guys could potentially got to 12 meters pretty much rivaling T-Rex in size, so it would have pretty much been the T-Rex before T-Rex, so still quite a large animal, and um, there's been lots of described, it would rival T-Rex in total length, and would um, use this as an approximate size for the natural ceiling of dinosaur and meat eaters, so it's kind of where you say this is pretty much how big this kind of ecology they could have got. Um, it is now considered a junior synonym of Torvosaurus, uh, basically because they're so similar, but there's been a detailed analysis hasn't been carried out yet, so we don't really know. But they also have been recorded uh, comparable remains from the Noma Nubian uh, Brontoraptor, which is another large megalosaurid that's been used. However, both Imaka Rex and Brontoraptor require reclassification to determine whether they're actually Torvosaurus tanneri, which is the species we just talked about, uh, or um, a species specimen like described prior. And it, so these could be potentially likely adult sizes or potentially really large specimens of Torvosaurus tanneri or both incomplete specimens that lack good colorants. So it's kind of something that in paleontology, because we're dealing with so much fragmentary remains, it's kind of hard to figure out. But it's very likely these could potentially just larger, very big individuals of um, Torvosaurus. In the same way, Saurophaganax could potentially be just a very large adult Allosaurus. Uh, it's kind of, um, as I mentioned, dealing with fossils. There is evidence to suggest that potentially Saurophaganax may be something different because there's another specimen. But we haven't found any adult uh, Allosaurus yet, so it uh, could very likely be uh, adult. Uh, Saurophaganax could be adult Allosaurus. So it's really one of those things. We just don't know much about sizes because we have so many fragmentary specimens. And as I mentioned, like with Pachycephalosaurus, there's like Stiggy Moloch, uh, Draco Rex, Stiggy Moloch, and Pachycephalosaurus. They were all described as different genera, but now they're pretty much all considered the same because they're considered growth stages. They could very much be the same case here with Saurophaganax being adult and Allosaurus being kind of subadult or potentially even juvenile. So yeah, very interesting. Um, but um, yeah, this was done by Master Duke. Really did a wonderful job. Definitely a big fan of that. So um, yeah. I think this is a great place to end the video. So I really, really, really hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified of anything. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye-bye.